When it comes to love stories, they simply do not have a happy ending within the context of most horror movie plots. Usually, those in love become fodder together by the time the end credits roll. But what if I told you that a love story within horror does exist? And what if it comes off as innocent and pure at first, but then evolves into something much more than we're led on to? We're not talking about the Bride of Frankenstein or even the Bride of Chucky. What would Martha Stewart say? Fuck Martha Stewart! You may have forgotten about one of the best remade love stories introducing a teenage vampire. A story about innocence lost on both sides of the spectrum. One being a bloodthirsty little girl that confines in an older guardian doing her dirty deeds to stay alive. The other being a loner, outcast teen with serial killer tendencies looking for nothing more than a girl to fall for and confide in. With every vampire flick, there is usually a catch, and this time it involves our hopeless romantic Owen about to go on a roller coaster of pure mayhem and chaos. Cloverfield director Matt Reeves' Let Me In is today's film that we're going to do a deep dive on. It's an incredibly strong retelling of the 2008 Swedish all-time classic, Let the Right One In. So, get on your sunscreen, sharpen your steaks, and wear that garlic, because Let Me In is just one of the best horror movies you never saw. It's a tall order to remake a film that has been perfectly adapted from its 2008 counterpart and let the right one in. It's an even taller order to give that to someone who at the time had only one directing credit to their name. Meet Matt Reeves. You probably have heard of his name since he established himself with amazing films such as Dawn and War of the Planet of the Apes. He also recently directed a very grounded and realistic approach on the newest take of DC Comics Caped Crusader and World's Greatest Detective, The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson. Prior to these Hollywood classics, Matt Reeves only had J.J. Abrams produce Cloverfield to his name. Even though Cloverfield was a box office success and showcased Reeves' technical approach to storytelling through POV, was it possible for Reeves to accomplish the massive undertaking of recreating Let the Right One In and making Let Me In the preferred iteration of the fucked up vampire love story between Sweet Abby and Owen? Let's dive in and discuss. Let Me In starts off in 1983 Los Alamos, New Mexico. We see an ambulance from a distance driving through the cold, snowy, chilly night carrying what appears to be a burn suspect handcuffed to a gurney struggling to talk. Paramedics tell dispatch that the man poured acid on himself and needs to be helped immediately. He's taken into the hospital and a detective comes in to question the suspect. The detective steps out of the room when he doesn't get answers and walks down the hallway to make a call. He hears screams coming from the nurse tending to the suspect and the detective runs back to the room only to see the suspect jump out of a window and become a murder outline on the ground below. The camera focuses on a letter left by the suspect that says, I'm sorry, Abby. We then are taken back two weeks earlier to see what caused this chain of events. We're introduced to Owen, played by Cody Smith McPhee. You see Owen eating candy by himself in the snow-filled courtyard, deciding not to dispose the wrappers in the proper way, typical kid stuff, and he's called in by his mother. And it's apparent there's no father figure in this household. While most kids like to play video games or a nice game of tag, our buddy Owen likes to wear creepy masks, playing voyeur via telescope in his neighbor's windows, and is perfecting his stabby stabby technique at mirrors. A real certified children's role model, if you ask me, Owen notices some new neighbors. The quote-unquote father, played by Richard Jenkins, of Step Brothers and Six Feet Under fame, and she grabs me by the wing. Shut the fuck up! Walking his daughter with a giant chest. The daughter is that foul-mouthed, kill-crazy superhero hit girl from the movie Kick-Ass, played by Chloe Grace Moretz. <laughs> Owen 
Owen opens the front door just a crack to notice his new love interest doesn't seem to be sporting any shoes, which is totally weird considering it's close to freezing outside, and that's nothing to shrug your shoulders about, right? The next day, we get Owen walking in the courtyard looking at his neighbor's window only to see them covered by cardboard. Guess they don't like that morning sun ruining their beauty sleep. We get a glimpse into Owen's personal life at school, and sadly, he's more of the bullied type. Spitballs, wedgies galore, and towel whippings are part of the boy's unfortunate curriculum. He goes to a local drugstore and purchases a Swiss army knife. Maybe for whittling wood, perhaps? He also takes part in spying on two teens making out. It seems Owen is yearning for a female companion to get his mind off of the negatives of his world. But dare I say, doesn't every adolescent want love and companionship growing up? Owen is in the courtyard at night again, working on his stabby stabby against some poor old trees. Treebeard from Lord of the Rings would be super pissed to see this happening. And then we're introduced to Abby, the shoeless love interest who warns Owen, we can't be friends, that's just the way it is. Way to add more insult to Owen's life, Abby. Now that Abby's father is watching this new bond form, we tag along for one of his nights out on the town. We're not too sure where it all leads until we see this father get into a teenager's car with clothing reminiscent of Matt Reeves' iteration of the Riddler from the Batman. It's there that the father drugs the unexpected teenager, hangs him upside down, and drains his blood into a jug. Unfortunately, Pops isn't too great at walking in the snow, so he slips downhill and pours all the blood over the snow and trees, creating the messiest crime scene for our detectives to solve. Way to go, Dad. Shut the fuck up! Owen starts to hear an altercation go down between the father and Abby through the walls. Although, Abby's voice is different. It's deeper and guttural and hanging on the brink of being between hangry and desperate. But when life gets hard, grab a Snickers, or in this case, more blood from an innocent victim. Abby takes matters into her own hands this time from a bystander walking through the community. We are finally revealed Abby's true form as she contorts and ravages around the poor man's body trying to flee. It's a lost cause as he becomes the main course on Abby's menu. Her father becomes pissed that he has another body to dispose of, creating more heat from the police that are following his trail. Abby notices a band-aid on Owen's face from the same bullies who have tormented him for the past few days. Abby tells Owen to stand up to his bullies and that she'll help him and hold Owen's hand. Owen decides to hang out with Abby the next night, taking her to an arcade and introducing her to some tasty taffy that Abby throws up, well, because she's a vampire and they aren't exactly the candy loving type. Owen is starting to fall for Abby, unbeknownst of what she truly is. However, Abby, at the same time, is leading Owen on. But why? Why is she even talking to Owen? Things take a turn for the worse when Abby's father tries to grab more blood for Abby by hiding in another teenager's car, but in an unfortunate turn of events, crashes the car down a snowy slope. It becomes a dire situation for the trapped father hearing the sirens not too far away. He decides to mask his identity and eliminate the trail back to Abby. He's gonna douse himself with acid in the face, causing unrelenting pain and anguish. And this is what wraps us back to the beginning scene. Abby hears about her father's dilemma on the radio from their apartment and takes a trip to the hospital as we the viewers watch her traverse up the front of the hospital and find her father's window. In truly grotesque fashion, we see the damage of what acid has done to Abby's father's face. While no words are spoken, the father signals to Abby to perform a mercy killing and she drinks the blood resulting from the fall to his death. Abby climbs into Owen's room and says she's not a girl, she's nothing. They share the bed and fall asleep. The next day, Owen goes on a class trip and is cornered by the bullies who threaten to throw him into the icy water. Owen decides to grow a pair and give one of the bullies a taste of their own medicine by splitting his ear open with a nicely placed stick in the side of the head. While the bully cries like a little bitch, a bunch of kids on the other side of the lake scream in terror as another body is uncovered underneath the ice. The poor neighbor of Owen 
who was a midnight snack for Abby a few nights prior and disposed of by Abby's father. The main detective tracks the death of Owen's neighbor back to him and his mother asking questions and snooping around the complex. Later that night, Owen tells Abby about sticking up to his bully, resulting in Abby to plant a big ol' kiss on Owen. Owen brings her to a secret apartment vacant in the complex and asks her to make a blood pact with him. He slices his finger, which is a massive no-no to do in front of a bloodthirsty vampire child, and Abby reveals herself to Owen in vampire form as she does everything in her power not to attack Owen. She runs off, climbing a tree in the complex. One of the neighbors across from Owen walks with her dog and is attacked by Abby, who is still on a blood high, and she goes straight for the jugular. Abby runs off, and the neighbor's boyfriend calls for help, which results in more police, and that pesky detective hot on the trail. When the detective gets more clues from the distraught boyfriend whose girlfriend was just attacked by Abby, the girlfriend goes up in flames when the nurse opens the curtain to a beautiful sunrise to start the day. The hospital room goes up in flames with both the nurse and the girlfriend in it. Abby visits Owen, but has not been allowed into the apartment. When Owen doesn't allow Abby in and rather says just walk inside as not a formal acceptance, Abby starts draining blood from within her own body until Owen says, Okay, come in. You can come in. You put two and two together when Owen picks up a very dated picture of Abby alongside what appears to be her father, but as a young, innocent child. You start to think Abby is using these boys through her innocence and charm to lure them into being her guardian? Is this her ploy into keeping herself immortal and having these children eventually become killers so that she can feed? Does she display any type of love or affection toward them? The viewer is left to decide if she's manipulative and selfish, or just trying to survive. When the detective narrows down the clues and finds out about the father's address by showing a sketch to the widower of the girlfriend who turned into barbecue the morning of, he kicks down the door and finds Abby sleeping in the bathroom tub. Due to Abby's eternal, childlike state, the detective considers her a potential trafficking victim. Once he tears the cardboard off from the window, potentially killing Abby, Owen screams, warning the detective, but that wakes up Abby in the process, and she jumps the detective, making this case go cold in the process. Literally, she takes off in a taxi and tells Owen she's gotta go, and disappears into the snowy night, and Owen is back to being alone. The climax is where the movie reaches the intense meter and pumps it to an all-time high. Those pesky bullies are back at it again, only this time the bully that lost half his ear gets his older brother in on the action. They stage a fire and force the kids to leave the pool. Owen tries to run to his locker for a knife, but that doesn't work as he's tossed into the pool. Owen, not being the best swimmer, has a hard time swimming to the surface, and when he does finally get to the edge of the pool, he's confronted. Forced to be underwater for three minutes, and honestly, who can even do that as a kid? If he can make it three minutes, he only gets a cut on his cheek, but if he doesn't, he loses an eye. This scene alone is where terror comes in many forms. The feeling of helplessness, the feeling of drowning, the despair, the camera focusing on the clock which isn't moving fast enough for Owen to get up, those bullies potentially realizing they may be committing murder, the absolute silence, it's all a masterclass in filmmaking with skin boiling tension. But all that silence and tension shifts at the snap of a whip when glass breaks from above and a demonic scream comes crashing down in the gym. A trail glides across the pool in rapid fashion. From Owen's perspective in the pool, you can see dismembered heads, a kid being dragged underwater upside down, hands, arms, legs, all skinning in the pool below with streams of blood all around him. It's one of those amazing holy shit moments in horror, which is the ultimate chef's kiss to this film. The close-up shot of Owen staring at the camera, looking at his hero, ultimately cementing himself as Abby's next guardian, oh, we get chills. We end this love story on a train, where Owen has a chest with him and he knocks on it. Abby is inside and she knocks back. It's that amazing love story that beats Romeo and Juliet or Jack and Rose. Hell, I'll throw in Bonnie and Clyde. Owen and Abby are just that power couple that most men and women strive to be. Sorry to Abby's last guardian, but Owen has you beat. Shut the fuck up!
Let Me In's ensemble is particularly impressive because it's the child actors who propel the entire story. Chloe Grace Moretz plays the angelic, comforting, and nurturing Abby who uses her heart and charm to win over Cody Smith McPhee's Owen by the time the credits roll. The audience will be left wondering what Abby's grand plan with Owen really was. Was it to secure another chock full of years using Owen as her own personal blood bank? Or was it to live another lifetime with someone she could confide in and love? Maybe it was both. It reminds me of my teenage years being carried along for a ride if you really ask me. Richard Jenkins' father slash guardian role in the film is as excellent as it is menacing. You can see hints of him begging for Abby's affection throughout, clinging on to their bond as Abby starts shacking up with Owen. He is an older mirror to that of Owen, but Abby knows that her guardian is being sloppier with age and tired, so she needs an alternative, even if that means letting him go in the process. Jenkins uses his role through emotion in his eyes. He's cold and he's focused. His mission is to serve Abby, even if it means that he has to kill in the process. Jenkins provides an excellent performance to this minor yet significant role. Dylan Minetti, who plays the smug punk bully here, plays it wonderfully. A character you're begging just to get his throat ripped out by the movie's end, and surprisingly, Dylan plays an asshole very well. Now, Minetti is no stranger to horror. He's been in many horror films, such as Scream 5, Goosebumps, Don't Breathe, and Open House. He also plays the main character Clayton in 13 Reasons Why on Netflix, which is a complete opposite demeanor to that of the bully in this movie. Let Me In had a two-month production in New Mexico with a critical reception of 88% on Rotten Tomatoes. It was also placed in multiple critic top 10 films of 2010, calling it a faithful remake of the original Swedish film. John Nording and Carl Molander, both producers of the original film, were brought on board to be producers for this remake. Let Me In grossed $24 million on a $20 million budget, so breaking even. Even if it didn't turn up a little bit of a profit, let Me In is one of those perfectly executed remakes that stand the test of time. Matt Reeves honors the original while also putting his own style into the film. I strongly feel like Let Me In is one of the better adapted vampire flicks in the ever-growing, ever-evolving subgenre. It's an intimate tale between a boy and girl, except the girl may be close to a thousand years old. But the movie has amazing cinematography by the incredible Greg Fraser, who also serves as the cinematographer on Matt Reeves' The Batman. It has impeccable substance and style due to the directing efforts of Matt Reeves. It has a star-studded cast with all actors still prominent in Hollywood today. A great setting in icy, snowy New Mexico, and lastly, a terrifying woven script that plays with the minds of its viewers. Are we like Owen and being strung along for Abby's own selfishness? Or do we want to know what it's like to have true companionship and to feel first love again in its own twisted way? Maybe it's a bit of both and we just need to go along for the ride, even if that ride could lead to inevitable tragedy, just like Abby's guardian. What a sucker you are, Owen. Thank you.